Okay, um, today what we're going to do uh, is attempt to give everyone a refresher course of continuing education provisions. Um, we'll also give a brief update on uh, recent changes to the ENA Regulation Act. Um, the most recent statute change happened in 2020. And we do have some rules changes that are going into effect fairly soon. So I'll talk about what those are as well. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on updates, but the bulk of this will be a continuing education refresher. Um, what I will uh, do is I am going to mute everyone for the duration of this because of the amount of attendees that are on. Um, if you do have questions, post them in the chat, okay? Um, I can't, uh, we won't have enough um, uh, wherewithal to un find and unmute folks uh, for asking questions. So if you do have a question, please post it in the chat. Um, as I mentioned to some other people, uh, I am recording this session. Um, so you'll be able to see the video of it at least. Um, and we do plan on posting it to the board's YouTube channel. Um, look for a link to that once that's done on uh, the board's Facebook page. And we'll get that going <clears throat> uh, as soon as we can. Okay. Okay, so the roadmap for this presentation is shown. I will go over the latest ENA Regulation Act changes. Um, these have been in effect for some time, and actually that should say 2020. Um, I will talk about the latest rule revisions that will go into effect this Saturday, October 8, 2022. So be mindful of that because there are some provisions of the rules that licensees should be aware of um, that changes uh, slightly some things dealing with practice. Um, I'll go over the continued education requirements, um, the 2019 rules changes, uh, Web-based online activities, we get a lot of questions about um, and what counts and what doesn't, which ones are restricted. Uh, I'll briefly cover self-guided CE activities because those are allowed. Um, I'll go over those and then a summary and then a Q&A period. But again, if you have questions uh, from here, uh, anytime in the presentation, if you're able, please post that in the chat. And I'll move on. Okay, so the latest um, E and A Regulation Act changes I'll briefly go over. Um, first of all, um, one of the changes gave the board the ability to um, uh, send licensees renewal notices via methods other than mail. So don't rely on postcards um, or renewal reminders from the board. Um, look out for those in email form, okay? Um, those will, um, it's just more efficient for the board to send out email notices um, versus postcard. And so that was a, a, one of the changes. Um, the board did add Canadian accredited programs who meet the CAAB accreditation program to meet the education component of licensure. Um, the other alternative, as you're probably all aware, is the ABET EAC accredited program. Um, that still is a component of licensure uh, that meets the education requirement, um, but we did add Canadian accredited programs. Um, also, for those um, who may not be aware, we did uh, what the board terms as decoupled. We decoupled the requirement that the four years of experience has to be gained prior to applying for the PE exam. Um, that four years or equivalent is still required as a component of licensure, but it can come now any time after graduation from your, uh, uh, after graduation. Um, so that change was really designed um, to accomplish a number of things. Um, it adds convenience and flexibility back to the licensed candidates to determine when it's uh, right for them to pass the exam. Um, if they do pass that PE exam early, and if they get started working in an industry that is an exempt setting, 
they may be more likely to become licensed because at that point, all they have to really do um, if they're working in that exempted industry is um, get their experience. Um, the board also believes more professional engineers uh, improves pub public protection. And uh, there was a large component, or well, actually the entire board um, thought that waiting unfairly impacted the ability of women to become licensed professional engineers. I won't go really into the details of that, but that was the feeling of the board at that time. Okay, uh, the rules revisions. Uh, now these were just signed uh, by the governor this week. So these are going into effect um, on, the, on October 8th, which is Saturday. And I'll go over what these are. Okay, the first uh, change, real change for licensees that you all need to be aware of is back in section six, uh, chapter six, the licensee seal. Um, the board, based on some compliance cases the board reviewed recently, where licensees were um, sealing plans that, you know, didn't really have a lot of, of interest, you really couldn't tell. Um, yeah, there's a licensee seal on here, but there was another organization or another, you know, non-related architect or, you know, like a, a, a drafting service or a lumber yard doing the plans and the licensee came on and reviewed those. It just got really confusing which entities were involved in that, um, in that work. So um, what this rule says is that technical submissions um, should include uh, the name of the project and either the address of or location of it. They all need to uh, show that um, really essentially wherever the, the seal is applied. Um, you need to put the name of the project and either the address or, or the location. In addition, if that work is not being done through an organization, the licensee should put their name and contact information on the technical submissions. Now, uh, licensees may already be doing this. Um, the board is just codifying this in a rule. Um, additionally, if the work is being done through an organization, um, the organization should put their legal name or DBA, their contact information, and the organization's certificate of authorization number on the technical submissions. Again, for um, firms, I think most firms are already doing this. Um, the one slight um, deviation might be your certificate of authorization number. So for anyone uh, associated with a firm, um, firms should start putting their CA number on their technical submissions, their drawings, their specs, um, again, anywhere the seal is applied, um, that CA number should be there if it's being done uh, through an organization. Um, I'm going to stop just for a second. Um, one of the attendees asked, will slides this presentation be, be available afterwards? Yes, they will. Um, I will post that uh, on Facebook as a PDF along with the link once I get this posted to the board's website. So look out for that. Uh, the other part of this rule, um, if you are using standards, standard details that a jurisdiction's prepared, City of Lincoln, City of Omaha, DOT, if you're incorporating those into your drawings, um, you should uh, put the name of the jurisdiction which prepared the standards um, on those technical submissions so the public and the board can, can see which jurisdiction prepared that standard detail? Any questions on this uh, technical submissions? Again, this is all, um, the board did just publish an electronic version of the updated uh, ENA Regulation Act handbook. These new rules are in there, so I would encourage you all to go to ea.nebraska.gov, download the new handbook, and those are back in chapter six. Okay, moving on. Um, another thing, uh, maybe not so important to you folks, but particularly to the board, um, we introduced, there is now a definition of a farm building. Um, farm building is used up in the statutes, 
8143 to describe certain exempt projects, farm buildings. Um, certain types of those are exempt. The problem was that the ENA Act, the statutes, don't have farm the term farm building defined. And so what the board um, ultimately decided to do was take the definition of an agricultural building that the state building code uses, which is, uh, and that state building code is established by uh, statute 71-6403. So essentially uses the 2018 IBC definition, which says it, it shall not be a place of human habitation, um, nor can it be a place of employment where products are processed, treated, packaged, or a place used by the public. So um, it's that definition gives a little more um, structure to the term farm building. And that will only help the board moving forward, uh, particularly when it deals with compliance cases um, that it reviews at its meetings. Uh, continuing education audits. Um, this is kind of a segue into the CE um, uh, meat of this presentation that I'll get into later. Um, the rule has now been modified to allow the board to audit the webinar. licensee at any time, not just in conjunction with a renewal yeah. process. Um, no. Don't, and I wouldn't be scared about that if you're a licensee. Yeah. Um, the issue is that the board wanted the ability to uh, be able to impose uh, or look at licensees continue education in instances other than the audit. Usually this will come up uh, dealing with a compliance issue, okay? And so most of the time, 99.99% .99 of you all um, won't, um, won't be an issue for you all. Um, really, this is just with the problem children that the board deals with. Um, and it, what this also does, it would potentially allow the board um, to uh, select people for audit in the next renewal cycle. So, uh, for example, if you had an issue, if you were selected for an audit uh, during your renewal and the board uh, found an issue with your continued education and it was serious enough um, that the board was very was concerned about this licensee's ability to um, satisfy the CU requirements, the board could say that, okay, we had a problem with you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Licensee, at this renewal. What we're going to do is also select you for audit in the next renewal cycle. So kind of putting them on notice, you know, this renewal cycle, your audit was not acceptable. We did get it fixed. Uh, consequently, um, you will be automatically included in the audit pool for the next renewal cycle. So just keep in mind um, that is something the board has talked about wanting to do for uh, at least over the past year. Again, it's based on some continued education uh, problems the board is seeing with, with licensees, and it saw this as a way to maybe uh, help uh, the compliance with those continuing education provisions. Um, the next change in the rule, uh, and the last one I'll go over, Rule 973. Um, this uh, is triggered when a licensee is selected for an audit, believes they have all the hours, uh, 30 hours for engineers or 24 hours for architects, um, submits those to the board, and again, the licensee thinks they're good. They think they've got all the hours. Uh, however, the board gets those uh, do that, that documentation, reviews it, and sees a problem with some of the hours. So the board, in that case, would disallow some of the hours. Um, so the rule will slightly change the process in that case. Again, that's not very common. Uh, most of the time, when people submit their hours, um, if they're if the hours are good. Um, you know, the board just lets that go. But this is allowed, this is in the case where the licensee believes they have the hours, but the board sees a problem with some of them and gives the, that licensee 
some period of time to um, to re get retake some of those hours. The exist the prior rule said the licensee had 120 days. The board lowering that to 60 um, with another 60 day option on top of that if the board request if that licensee requests an, an extension. So it's they would still. Um, ultimately get the 120 days if they need it. They will have to request it, um, but it's just a slight modification. So that is all the um, upcoming rules uh, that are going to be changed on Saturday, this Saturday. Um, again, here's a reminder, the updated PDF of the ENA Regulation Act handbook is up on the website. And it, it includes everything I have just discussed. Um, so if you care to, go up and download that. Um, all right, talk about the 2019 CE changes. Um, most of these changes are just looking at things like NCWS model law or NCARB model law and model rules, and just making sure that our uh, types of activities are described kind of meet up um, or, or uh, corroborate with those model uh, laws or rules. Um, if you're, for example, if you're taking a college course from an institution that, that offers ABET, EAC accredited programs, um, or NCARB, um, or NAB accredited programs, I'm sorry, I didn't put NAB in there, but those are also um, allowed. Um, so if you take a three semester hour at the College of Engineering or College of Architecture, um, that will equate to 45 hours times three, um, whatever that works out to be. So that is far and away um, all the hours you need um, with the exception of your, your one ethics hour. Um, same uh, calculation for if that institution calculates their hours by quarters instead of semesters, um, you take that those quarter hours times 30 and that um, equates to how many hours um, of continuing education for those. Um, again, short courses, tutorials, web-based activities, distance ed, um, those are given uh, credited hour for hour if the topic is acceptable. Um, if you're presenting or attending, you know, seminars, in-house courses, workshops, professional or technical presentations, again, those are all credited on an hour for hour basis. Um, if you happen to teach or instruct at one of the activities listed above, you can get credited double um, but you can't, if you give the same seminar, um, in-house course, workshop, you can't um, keep counting it double every time. Essentially, you'll get um, double the credit once for that. Now, if the content changes on that and the learning objectives change, uh, yes, you could potentially get another double credit for that. But if you're giving the same course in multiple locations, um, and the content has not changed, you'll only get the double credit once for those, if that makes sense. Um, other things that are acceptable. Uh, if you author a, a published paper, article, or book, those are worth 10 hours of peer-reviewed, uh, five hours if not. Um, if you participate in the development of items for NCWS or NCARB examinations, uh, you'll be able to get time for that on an hour-for-hour hour basis. Um, if you're actively serving uh, as an officer or a committee of a professional or technical society, um, you can get two hours credit for that. Um, now, there has been some discussion about, um, you know, what, you know, we're, I'm a member of, let's see, ICC, and I'm, participating on a committee that spends way more hours than two hours, um, which should I, um, you know, is it just two hours or can I um, ask for all the hours we spent on that committee? Um, I would say the rules say two hours, but if you can make a strong case if you're audited for why um, the actual hours should count, um, you can make that case at your uh, audit if you're selected. Um, another question that came in on the chat panel, um, can you use the double credit per renewal 
if it's the same similar coursework. Uh, in other words, if the course is held every single year. Um, that I am not 100% sure of. I would tend to say no um, if that, uh, if again, if that course content didn't change. I would hesitate to say that you can count it again. Um, but that I may have to ask the board on. <laughs> so I will put a pin in that one and ask the board uh, on that particular one. Uh, if you're involved in a patent related to engineering or architecture, I know the slide doesn't say architecture, but um, that's what the rule says. Um, you will get 10 hours um, for that work. And then if you're actively participating in educational outreach activities to K through 12 or university students, you can get credit for that time for an, uh, again on an hour for hour basis. So that's just an overview of the, um, the, the number of hours credit. Um, again, if you have additional questions, let us know in the chat. Um, if I'm able to answer them here, I'll, I'll try to. Okay, here is the big one uh, that's changed beginning of 2022. Um, and I, at this point, I will say, I freely admit that this rule um, is not written as well as it could. This rule is rule 9.3.4. Um, what this rule says, and I'll just read it verbatim, is a learning activity that is non-technical in nature and addresses a topic that is not part of that profession's body of knowledge as developed by the National Professional Engineering Society or is not categorized as a health, safety, and welfare topic by NCARB is not an acceptable continuation activity. Uh, in other words, um, CE activities must address, this is the, really the, the way the rule should have been written. They have to address either a technical topic or a topic identified in an engineering society's body of knowledge or an HSW topic as identified by NCARB. Um, and I'll talk a, uh, quite a bit more about this. So for the engineers on the call, um, NSPE, I believe back in 2013, uh, developed the professional engineering body of knowledge. Um, other engineering societies have also done the same thing. Um, ASCE did the civil engineering body of knowledge. Um, Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers developed theirs in 2019. Um, if you are part of a, um, like, if your profession uh, professional society doesn't develop one, you can always use the NSPE's body of knowledge um, for their topics um, as kind of the default fallback on. So NSPE's body of knowledge, it's uh, available publicly on NSP, NSPE's website. These are the topics they cover, mathematics, um, natural sciences, humanities, a whole bunch of technical topics and a whole slew of professional practice topics, including business aspects of engineering, ethical responsibility, teamwork, project management, um, and legal aspects of engineering. So those are the acceptable uh, topics, and they are very broad. Um, and so um, if it's not, if the topic of the activity is not one of these, it has to be technical and granted um, I will freely admit that the, the term technical as used in our rules is not identified or not defined at this point in time. Um, for the architects, um, if you may not, uh, you may not know that AIA does not develop health, safety, and welfare topics. Um, NCARB is the entity who does that. And their uh, topics are covered in a publication called NCARB's Continuing Education Guidelines. And on the screen is the link to the CE guidelines. It's, it should be fairly easy to find on NCARB's website, but if not, I'll leave this up on the screen uh, for you all. Um, these topics generally follow, uh, they're broadly organized into uh, and mirror the divisions of the ARE, practice management, project management, and so on. Um, so I'll just briefly roll through these uh, practice management topics are areas 
related to the management of architectural practice and the details of running a business. So things like risk management, information management, supervisor training, those are all allowable HSW topics. Under project management, uh, category focuses on areas uh, related to managing arch architectural projects through execution. So contract negotiation, consultant management, scheduling, QA, QC, value engineering, those types of topics all HSW topics. Uh, programming and analysis, um, evaluation of project requirements, constraints, and opportunities. So we're looking at um, programming, site selection, adaptive reuse, environmental impact. Again, all listed in the CE guidelines uh, document. Project planning and design, uh, focusing on areas related to preliminary design of sites and buildings. Um, you know, so those topics uh, shown on the screen, sustainability, lighting, acoustics, budget development, master planning, all HSW topics. Uh, project development and documentation. Um, so now we're looking at areas related to the integration and documentation of building systems, material selection, material assemblies into a project, FF&E, materials, construction documents, HSW topics. Construction and evaluation. Uh, again, areas related to construction contract admin and post occupancy evaluation. So those topics: building commission, building commissioning, POE, uh, contract administration. Again, uh, negotiation. All HSW topics. Okay. Any questions from the panelists uh, or from the attendees on the acceptable topics? Before I move on. Okay, seeing none. Um, now I'll talk about web-based online activities and self-guided activities. Um, again, here's another rule that in hindsight, I think we should have written um, a little clearer. Um, so this is really talking about rule 9.3.1. We've had this on the, on the books for a number of, of, of years, and I'll just go through what it means. So certain web-based offerings are restricted. Um, so, but there are, are five categories of providers whereby all web-based offerings are not restricted. So those are IACET approved providers, institutions of higher education that have accredited programs in engineering or architecture, uh, professional engineering societies or architectural societies, so NSPE, AIA, ASCE, uh, technical societies and associations recognized at a national level, so that's AISC, uh, the Wood Council, um, entities like that, or governmental agencies. Those are all non-restricted, so you can get, if, if you take web-based activities, CE activities from those categories of providers, you can get all your hours potentially from those. Um, and here's another um, thing to keep in mind. If there's a web-based offering led by an instructor that enables, uh, like this set, setting very much, um, that enables both the instructor and attendees to give, receive, and discuss information in real time is not restricted. So in real time means either voice or chat. We have a live chat here available, this chat here, um, means that this course uh, is not restricted and meets the requirements of that um, of that that uh, rule 9.3.1.1. So we've kind of put this um, that those two rules in a flowchart, um, and you start in the upper right. So again, is the activity a real time activity? Can you all ask uh, questions and get those answers in real time? If you can. Uh, it is not restricted. You can get all your hours from those types of providers if allowed. Um, if you don't have the ability, like it's a correspondence course, you go online, read something, then take a test. There's no interaction with anybody. Um, that is a, that's not in real time. So then you would move over here um, to the right at the top. Um, is the activity provided by one of the five types of providers? Well, if it's not in real time, but it's provided by one of those five categories of providers, 
then again, that course is not restricted. Um, but if it is, um, if it is not given by a provider, um, one of those five types, it is restricted and there's a cap on hours. And you can only get a quarter of your hours from online restricted providers. And this is an issue that comes up all the time with CE audits. And with this webinar, something we're trying to uh, help reduce for, for the board. Any questions about um, the web-based uh, restricted activities before I move on to the self-guided? Okay, seeing none. Um, self-guided activities. Um, the board has had this provision uh, or this, 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 this method of getting CE hours for at least 15 years. Um, and my understanding of how this came about is um, the board realizes that there's a lot of areas in Nebraska that are, um, you know, don't have a lot of CE providers located around. You know, granted, nowadays there are a lot of online providers, but still the board wanted the ability to give um, a method whereby a licensee could gain hours on their own, right? So the self-guided activity is if a licensee undertakes learning on their own, not related to their normal job, um, they can gain, again, up to a quarter hours. Um, I know that the screen says seven and a half hours. That's for engineers. Um, architects can also use this for six hours. Um, you do have to complete one of these forms, um, but this form is designed for Again, activities that are planned and performed under the licensee's own direction and guidance. Um, so again, on the form, you'll have to um, explain what you did, what you learned, and that's one of the most important things on the, firm, on the form is what did you learn? The board wants to see what you learned, um, what outside sources you use for information, and what materials, if you did use materials, what materials did you use? So if you want to be, uh, if you undertake activities on your own, um, use this self-guided form. I will also say you can self-guide your ethics hour. There's nothing in the rules that precludes a licensee from doing something self-guided on their own that relates to the ethical practice of engineering or architecture. There's nothing that precludes you from doing that as a self-guided activity. So I just wanted to point that out for everyone. Any questions on the self-guided uh, activities before I move on? Okay, seeing none, if not, um, just kind of move closer to the end here. Uh, summary of hours, again, the board did modify this um, during the, when the pandemic really hit in, in mid-2020, um, although the board chose not to uh, maintain those levels in 2022. So um, as written in the rules in the handbook, um, this is what's required for um, licensees. 30 hours for PEs, 24 hours for architects, um, the restricted online hours, or a quarter of each, seven and a half for engineers and six for architects. Um, Self-guided activities, seven and a half and six. Um, everyone has to get their ethics hour and the, the max carryover is half of, um, half of the re total required hours. So if you gained, um, if you're an engineer, you gained 35 hours last, um, the prior renewal cycle, you essentially have five extra and you can use those five in the next renewal cycle. Um, so you do have to prove. So if you're using carryover, you have to submit your CE logs from that previous renewal period, as well as the current renewal period. Um, I noticed in the chat um, that um, Zach Thurber says he was recently licensed, so he will not need any CE hours for this initial period. That is absolutely correct. Um, but he's asking if, can you use CE hours for, um, now 
See hours taken during 21 and 22. Count for the future 23, 24. No, they do not. Um, I will say if you potentially got carryover, like if you got, if you're an engineer and you got more than 30 hours in your initial renewal period, uh, remember and, uh, licensees on their first period have no CE requirement. Um, how we've always interpreted that is they don't need them, but if they got more um, than 30, if they're an engineer, if they got more than 24 for an architect, they could use those for carryover. Um, but again, they would have to prove it again uh, through uh, submittal of documentation if they're selected for an audit. So hopefully, Zach, that answers your question about that. Okay, um, CE audits and renewal process. Um, we have slightly changed our online renewal process. Most licensees won't notice it, but I will go over what has changed. Um, again, during the audit process, uh, we can audit up to 5% of licensees for an audit of their continuing education. Uh, if a licensee is selected, um, licensees are notified once they've uh, completed the renewal process. In other words, once they've answered all the disclosure questions, you know, have uh, action been taken against you by any other state licensing board? Um, are you done with your CE? Um, so we will, you'll be notified only after you've asked, answered all the questions and paid your fee. Um, I'll stop one uh, for one second. Um, for someone who joined late, yes, this webinar is being re recorded. We do hope to post it on the board's YouTube channel as soon as we can. Um, so if you're one of the lucky licensees who are selected for an audit, um, our compliance officer will contact you with next steps. You will be notified with a pop-up on the online license renewal system. Um, you need to submit a log of your CE credits. We have a log uh, to use on our website and your completion certificates, attendance verification records, or whatever other documentation you have that proves you attended those claimed activities. Um, you do not necessarily have to get a completion certificate. That always helps. Um, but if not, you can submit other evidence such as a, you know, a registration or you know, a post-event um, uh, post evaluation survey, you know, just something that, that would lead us to believe that you actually attended that um, activity if you don't have a completion certificate. Um, also wanted to remind everyone, we don't pre-approve CE courses or providers. So if you're thinking about a course and you want to call up the, you know, the board staff and ask, hey, I've got this course coming up, is that going to be allowed? We cannot tell you that information. Um, we just, again, the rule prohibits us from giving a, a thumbs up or thumbs down on, on specific CE courses or providers. Uh, agendas potentially uh, could be allowable uh, evidence um, if that, again, um, tends to uh, remove any reasonable doubt that you attended that activity. Um, here's the, the, the big change that we recently instituted. Um, we used to have the option online where um, uh, licensees could say, I'm not quite done with their continuing education. Um, the system, online system would allow them to complete and pay their fee. Um, what that, though, created on the staff side is another track of folks who, you know, now we have this CE, uh, this pool of auditees. Now it created another um, almost larger pool at times of people who said they weren't done, but we're going to get it done. And so we had to track those. Um, so the board discussed that issue and decided that the rule says um, th how they interpreted rule 9.1.1 is you have to be done with your CE um, before you can uh, complete the renewal process. So your CE has to be done before you complete the renewal process. Um, so this is what, um, for those who have video, um, there is still the question 
uh, on our renewal system um, I have that says, asks, I have not yet satisfied the continuing education requirements of Nebraska. If you select that box, this is what's going to happen. The system will, will halt and say, uh, per this rule, everyone has to, to meet CE as a condition of license renewal. Once you have completed the CE requirements, you may complete the renewal process. So if you're not done with it, um, the system will not allow you to proceed. And I will also mention this. Um, if you say you're done uh, and then you're selected for an audit, and then when you submit your log and documentation, it founds out, we find out you weren't done and got uh, activities completed after you said yes on the online renewal system, the board is not going to look um, very, um, that's not going to, to sit well with the board, I can tell you that right now, because of the, the issues that have just, the board has seen over previous renewal cycles, the board is, you know, its patience has been worn very thin. So I will counsel everyone, and I'm not an attorney, um, but I will say if you have not uh, satisfied the mandatory CE, don't go and renew. Once you finish your CE, that's when you can go on renew. Because if you say yes, and we the board finds out that you actually lied uh, on that question, the board is not going to look favorably, favorably on that situation uh, with your CE. Um, the board is looking at potentially increasing penalties um, for those who don't comply with CE, including um, offering settlement agreements, which means disciplinary action from the get-go. So um, hopefully um, this information I'm, I'm distributing to you all, um, take that to heart. Um, I don't want to see anyone um, run afoul with the board because they had planned on getting some CE after they finished their online renewal. Um, just don't do it. Um, get all your CE done and then go on and uh, finish the online renewal system. Okay, other CE items of note, just one additional thing I wanted to add. Um, I, I get, we get questions every now and then about completion certificates. Um, I want to, I'm giving a talk down at an architecture firm um, on this building system. Um, I'd love to get um, completion certificates to everyone but I'm just, you know, a one-person shop. What should, what information should be on those completion certificates? Um, I will say that the rules don't have any language um, about what completion certificates say. But over the years, um, myself and the compliance officer um, really like to see these types of things on the completion certificates if you're issuing them. We like to see the title of the activity, uh, the date and time and location of it who presented and or who was the provider. Um, number four is the most important. What, it, what were the learning objectives of the activity? In other words, what was this learning activity designed, what knowledge was it designed to impart on the attendees? Um, that is far and away um, the most important thing that we like to see on the completion certificates. Um, Lastly is the delivery method because that does help us determine whether it's, it's in real time or not. And if it's from uh, that in conjunction with the provider, helps us to determine if it's from a restricted provider or not. So again, those five things on the screen, title, date, time, and location, provider, the list of learning objectives, again, the most important, and the delivery method. Um, so we would love to see those on completion certificates. Okay, um, that wraps up the uh, presentation. Again, I apologize for um, those people who weren't able to join via video. Um, I, like I said, we are recording this and we will post that to our um, boards, um, to the board's YouTube channel. And I will, we will post a link to that to our Facebook page uh, when we make a Facebook post on this. Um, but I am now happy to entertain any additional questions that anyone else may have. And again, if you're able to um, type it in the chat, 
um, and we will um, we will try to answer those. So I'll give that if, uh, about a minute here. Um, I would also, if, if anyone is a call-in user, um, I'm going to try to unmute you if you do have a pressing question, um, because I think we have a lot of people who are calling in. Um, and so um, if you do want to uh, answer uh, ask a question over the phone, um, I will try to unmute you if you raise your hand on the call-in. Okay, while we're waiting for that, um, potentially any questions, again, um, everyone who uh, attends this should get uh, one hour of credit for this. Um, we do have a list of everyone who registered and a list of those who actually attended. Um, it looks like we have, at the moment, 180 attendees, so um, that's a pretty good um, rate um, for um, those who registered and those who were able to join. Again, uh, I apologize for if you're trying to join through a computer, um, we apologize for our difficulties, but hopefully um, you got uh, what you could from the video or from the audio, and then we will post this also on the, uh, on the board's Facebook, uh, Facebook page and YouTube. Okay, well, um, seeing no additional questions, I will let everyone, we're at 12.55, I will let everyone get back to um, their regularly scheduled programming, and I want to thank everyone for joining and listening on behalf of the board. Take care, everyone.